As my wife will tell you, um, I spent a lot of time on the internet, answering emails, looking up various things, writing pieces for other people, and uh, I've got a Twitter feed and uh, email, Facebook, all of the above. It's amazing what you can find on the email. And one of the things that came up was a story, true story, that happened on the now defunct Johnny Carson show, the Tonight Show. Still, in my opinion, the king of late night. And um, what happened was, is that a, a boy of about 12 years of age had heroically saved his parents from a coal mining accident in West Virginia. And so, all over the papers and here in this spot, on the Tonight Show. So he's sitting there, of course, in that big chair, talking to Johnny Carson. And the subject, and I'm not sure how it happened, because you didn't get that part of the clip, that church came up, and it turned out this boy went to church. So you could tell Johnny Carson was trying to think about what he was going to say about that. And I guess a Bible story, this one, the Gospel reading, came to mind, and said, do you know the story of Jesus turning the water into wine? And the boy said, yes, sir, I do. And Johnny says, what do you think that story means? That's not a question I would have expected from a talk show host. And so, but the boy, undeterred, thought a minute, and he said, well, I guess the moral of the story is, is that if you're going to have a wedding, make sure you invite Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think actually is a really good proof. <laughs> this is, in fact, meant, this story, meant to showcase who Jesus is, someone completely unlike him, either before or since. Jesus, Savior of the world, God in the flesh. Not one amongst a number of co-religious teachers, but in a very unique way, as John says in his first chapter, and the Word was made flesh among us, full of grace and truth. We have seen his glory. Whose glory? The glory of the only begotten of the Father. In other words, very unique. And John's whole gospel is organized, among, in, among other ways, around seven very clear, distinct miracles, what John calls signs. Signs for what? Signs that point to the fact that Jesus is, who he says he is, the Son of God. And that's the point of this story, that this very earthy, homey story that any Jewish village could relate to is an opportunity where Jesus reveals an extraordinary miracle, saying something I think really important about the fact that Jesus is actually very concerned about real day-to-day -day stuff. Um, there is no place in the Christian life, you see, for if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, for you to have these religious sentiments, even if they are sentiments as in, yes, I really am a Christian, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and your secular life, quote-unquote, over here. One of the points of these stories is that Jesus is stepping into a very real secular celebration, as it were, and showing his miracle there. This miracle is not happening, you see, in the marriage celebration with a rabbi. It's happening at the party. Um, how many of you have ever been to a wedding reception where there was a very clear disconnect between what was happening in the reception and what happens in the marriage service in terms of its tenor? Well, where did Jesus show up? He was at the reception, you see. That's where the miracle is taking place. And I, I think that's a part of the point of John's story. So what I want to do is open this up a little bit and see what else this has to say with, for us. First of all, you need to understand in a village in first century Israel, if somebody got married, the whole village was invited. So there were literally hundreds, if not thousands, of people present. In fact, that goes on in places. We have friends of ours, uh, one man whose family is from India, and he flew back for one of his relatives' wedding, and small little village in India, the entire village was invited. There, was, there were like a thousand people there. Um, so we don't have, it's not our idea where everybody gets these very nice engraved invitations and if, no, 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 everybody shows up. And so we're talking about a lot of people, first of all. Secondly, we see the fact that Mary has some relationship with this family because she actually has some authority with the servants. 
Uh, she wasn't just a guest. Some other, something gave her the ability to, in essence, tell the servants what to do. And as Mary's son, Jesus could, in fact, do the same. And that's what takes us more deeply into, I think, one of the heartbeats of this story. Because there's no wine. And they've run out. Now, you need to know, this is huge. It's not a question of, well, get in your car and go to ABC. We'll, get, we'll take care of this. <laughs> this is a huge deal. And in fact, it was so socially important to make sure that there was plenty of food and plenty of wine for the whole span of the wedding celebration. And in again, this time, that was days, not three or four hours. It was days of feasting and celebration that it would have been talked about for generations if they had run out of wine. Oh, you know Bob's family? It was his grandfather. They ran out of wine at the reception. Can you imagine? Everybody would just shake their head. Shame on that family. So we're talking about a family's reputation here. Not just the absence of, you know, we didn't have enough punch. So it's a big deal. Mary goes to Jesus, and Jesus replies to her, in, in a way that almost to our ear sounds rude. Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour is not yet come. What son speaks to his mother like that? If, if one of our sons looked at Laura Lee and said, Woman, what do you think? <laughs> but you see, this means something different there. We, the idiom, it's an idiom, and it doesn't quite translate well in English. Um, in fact, some translations would even have even taken it. The NIV, I think, uses the term dear lady. In other words, it's neutral. It, it's not meant in any way to be offensive. And what he's saying, in essence, is, why is that my problem? That's really what he's asking. In other words, I'm really sorry, but why are you asking me? And then he says, of course, sounding rather cryptic, my hour is not yet come. It's a phrase that's used in the Gospel of John again and again specifically to, for that time when something happens where he is revealed as who he says he is, specifically in his death on the cross and in his resurrection from the dead. When he speaks of his hour, that's really what he's talking about, his death and resurrection. So yeah, he said, I'm not ready to, in essence, show my hand. But the extraordinary thing is, is that he changes his mind. After he, in essence, says to Mary, I'm not the host here, he, in fact, turns and does something. So much so, and I guess Mary thinks it'll be okay, he'll take care of this, because she immediately turns to the servants after he makes that comment and says, you just do whatever he tells you to do. Mm -hmm. So Jesus turns to the servants, and it says there are these large stone water jars. And I mean, we're talking like about this high. And what they were used for is that every when the guests would arise, and it was a very important ceremony, that a servant would show up with wash basin, towel, pitcher. And everyone who was going to eat would place their hands over the basin, like up here, you've noticed, right? And the water gets poured over the hands, the towel is taken, the hands are washed, so the hands are ready to eat the meal. And so that's why all of those big stone jars are there to begin with. But at this point, that's already happened. So there's not a lot of water in them. So Jesus orders, fill the stone jars with water. So servants, they obey what Jesus says. So they fill the stone jars with water. And then Jesus says something to perhaps one of the head servants. Well, we don't know. He says to one of the servants, he says, now... Draw some out and take it to the chief steward. Who is the chief steward? He, he's like the maitre d'. He's the fellow who makes sure that what shows up on the buffet line actually is okay. And that the wine is up to snuff. So he's actually, the servant is supposed to take what is in essence a large label. Dip it down into water. <coughs> And then carry it over, ceremonially, of course, with everyone noticing. This is not a private act. Over to the chief steward to make sure that everything is okay. What do you think is going on in the mind of that servant? He's really caught in a double bond. 
Because on the one hand, he actually can't say no to Jesus because Mary, someone in some authority in this family, has instructed the servant to do what Jesus says. So he's got to do what Jesus says. You see, it, he, he could have lost his job. And in that situation, it's not a question of just merely losing your job. You're, you're out of employment. No one in the village is going to hire you. In other words, you're being consigned to begging at that point. So he is not going to lose his job. He, that's just, he doesn't want that to happen. So he's going to obey Jesus. But if he shows up across the room to the chief steward with a ladle that's supposed to have wine in it, and it's just full of water, what do you think is going to happen to him there? How dare you? Out! What's he going to do? But he obeys. That's the interesting thing. So it's like, okay. And he takes it over to the steward. And at some point, we don't know exactly when, between the time that steward, that servant turned from Jesus and began to make his way over to the steward, and by the time that ladle actually reached the steward, the water had become wine. And as the story ends, in this wonderfully kind of earthy fashion, the steward says, you know, everyone serves the good wine first. In other words, they want to impress their guests with their pocketbook and taste. But then the inferior wine comes out after the guests are so drunk they can't tell the difference. But you have kept the good wine until now. The best wine. The very best wine. Extraordinary wine. That shocks the chief steward. That's the sense of what's happening here. But notice, what would have happened if the steward, if the servant rather, had said to Jesus, I can't do that. I'll lose my job. You don't know what it's like around here. This man's a tyrant. All of which could have actually been true if he, if he had said that, you see. In other words, for me, the heart of the story is twofold. Number one, as we said in the beginning, this story is meant to say something very powerfully important about the nature of who Jesus is. Messiah, Son of God, Savior of the world, nothing is impossible for him. And that the miracle, too, is centrally located within the context, not of a worship service, but of a party. Because Jesus is blasting away the lines between sacred and secular. If he is Lord, remember the reading in 1 Corinthians, no one can say Jesus is Lord. That means you're in charge of my whole life. Everything, sacred and secular, I want to be who you want me to be, wherever that is, and I know you're going to be with me wherever I am, whether I'm at the wedding or whether I am at the party, because you're the Lord of the whole earth. But the second thing that it shows us beyond, the third thing, beyond who he is and his concern for all of life, including things like no wine at a party, is the obedience of that servant. Because you see, the second, the story, in fact, does more than say something about the unique nature of Jesus. It invites us, as his servants, to be a part of what I believe is an ongoing miracle. We are invited by this story to be the servant who carries the water turned into wine. That's for me, the heartbeat of what is being said here. In other words, there's a, there's a choice in this story. First choice. Would you read the story and say, based on this and much else, yes, I want to be one of his. I, I believe that he is the Lord of heaven and earth. I will follow him wherever I am, so that because I know he is everywhere. So whether I'm in a restaurant or on the beach or in church or at home, it doesn't matter. I know that I am in the companionship of his presence. And he is with me wherever I am. And I am his wherever I am. Because he is Lord of earth. But it's not just a kind of personal acquisition. A, a faith that changes you, although it is that. It is also a willingness to be the servant in the story. A willingness to take what God is doing in you, the water turned to wine, 
and use it in the life of other people. To be Jesus' servant so that the miracle is not just something that you know and love and are grateful for, but it's also it is a miracle that God uses you to bless other people. To be that servant. You see, it, it, the real clue has everything to do with the opening prayer. Grant that your people illumined by word and sacraments may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory. Thomas Cranmer's extraordinary words. That he, meaning Jesus, may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. That's, that was the tone that was set at the very beginning of this service. So it, it is within that invitation and that call for God to use us, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed, that we read all of the rest of the lessons, the extraordinary promises in Isaiah about God calling us married, those whom he is unequivocally pledged to no matter what. And that his delight is us, is his people. I mean, and I, I want to say to you, unless you know that God delights in you, you will never actually really know the joyous adventure of being that servant in obedience. Because you'll always question whether or not there's real wine in you or not, or if it's still just, you know, water. Faith in Christ, courage in Christ, servanthood in Christ, in some ways has everything to do with how you view God and how you think God views you. If you believe that despite your sin, despite all of the stuff of what it means to be a human being, God is unequivocally pledged to you, like Isaiah promises, and that he will, in fact, be with you, and that he is committed to you. So you don't have to wake up in the morning and go, oh, let me see, does God like me today? Because if you're in that position, you're going to hide out. Because you'll be afraid. You'll wrestle with things like fear of rejection and not wanting to step out and be adventurous about much of anything because you're so insecure in terms of your relationship with God. But if you know deep within your heart, because yes, you've come into the waters of baptism, you've said, yes, I am his follower, that his commitment to you is unequivocal. Unequivocal. Without exception clauses then that gives you a kind of confidence, a kind of adventurous boldness, that you really, will, you really are willing. If God wants to use you at the party, in the restaurant, at home, on your job, you're up for it. Because you know he'll give you what you need, and that he'll work through you as he chooses. That's the real message of 1 Corinthians 12. God, by His Spirit, will activate in you that which He desires so that you can do what He asks. I mean, He pays for it. He provides for it. All we have to do is act on what it is that He has given us, and that take us, takes us to the story of the servant in the Gospel of John. That if Jesus is who He says He is, and what He has poured into us is nothing less than His own very nature, his power, his grace, his forgiveness, his mercy, his beauty, his joy, all of who he is, then it is in that situation that we can step into sometimes extraordinary places of need and pain or just the gentleness of praying for another person, knowing that God is there and he will use us. So, number one, do you believe? Number, number two... Will you be a servant? Those are the real questions for me that this gospel message raises. I hope you have the courage and the grace to say yes to both. Yes, I belong to him. I do believe. And yes, I will be his servant. P.S. At one level, you've already said yes to both of those questions. That's the meaning of baptism and confirmation. And you'll hear that echo when Deborah is presented for confirmation and we walk through the baptismal promises again, you'll hear it about being his servant, about respecting the dignity of people, about serving Christ, repenting when you fall into sin, all of these things that we call our baptismal covenant. But let's be honest. 
It is quite possible to go through a lot of church liturgy and have it go straight over your head and not change your day-to-day -day behavior at all. Right? Nod your head. Come on. <laughs> I'm your bishop. We can be honest here. <laughs> and so what I'm asking you to do, in essence, is to take seriously the things that you were about to say. And ask God to work in you the very depth of what these promises mean. Because believe me, and I mean this deeply, Jesus is looking for people who are willing to be his servants in the midst of the extraordinary needs that are all around us. God has given us an incredible gift, a gift that in fact can heal the pain of the people around us. It's daunting, but it's really the only way to live. Are you willing to say yes to the yeses that you are about to say? That's the real question. Let us pray again. Gracious Lord, thank you that we gather this morning at the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. This is the reenactment of our wedding, and we thank you, Jesus, that you are here. Thank you that you are the one who sees our hearts, who knows who we really are. And I pray that you would give us the grace and the courage to say yes, both to you and to the promises that are being asked of us, that New Smyrna Beach, Edgewater, Volusia County, and all of the places where we go will be touched by your love and grace, and that you will use us, because that's what you desire. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen.